So there was a terrible water crisis in the forest. The clouds were disappearing and the rivers were running dry. There were five animals in this forest and each of them responded to the water crisis in a very different way. The first kind of animal was the tapirs. The tapirs were at the bottom of the river and they were crying out, the world is ending. They would bury their long snouts in the sand and they would be utterly hopeless. And then there were the monkeys. The monkeys had an attitude, you only live once. They were splashing around in the pond, wasting all this water, but just having as great a time as they could. And then you had the hornbills. The hornbills were so scared that the water would run out. They would scoop water from the rivers and save them into huge tree trunks for fear that there wouldn't be any water. The fourth kind of animal were the water rats. The water rats were always thought that water came from the dams. All they had to do was to work to build bigger and higher dams. And the last animals were the elephants. The elephants were the top of the mountains and they had all the water they ever needed. They had huge water wheels and they were inventing technology to draw water from the minerals. A water shortage was not an elephant's problem. So as you can tell, this is a, not only a, a story about water, but a story about money. And we tell this story to audiences as young as six years old. Through a process called Forum Theatre, kids play different roles of the different animals and negotiate a solution to solve this crisis together. And what they find out is a couple of things about money. They first realize that the tapirs actually had a unique ability they were the only animals who actually had these long snouts who could sniff out new water sources if only they believed in themselves. They learned that earning money is about service, it's about creativity, and it's about integrity, and not about getting a college degree. They learned from the monkeys that it's okay to have fun, and they invent these closed water circuits so that they could have fun and do it in a sustainable way. Children learned that spending money is about moderation. They learned from the hornbills that there was a very different problem, that you could save all this water in the huge tree trunks, but they were starting to rot because the, money could, the, the, the water could be used for something else. They learned that saving is about being purposeful or it would turn into unhealthy hoarding. They learned from the water rats that they were getting really, really tired. Building bigger and larger dams was not going to solve this problem and they had to look up to look at new solutions to invest in. They learned from the elephants, finally, about unity, about interdependence, and about the importance of sharing and giving. So I tell this story because money is so riddled with complexity, with emotion. And what if you are a young person or even a young adult who doesn't have the language to talk about money, but you're so aware of what money does to your lives? I also tell this story because there are three urgent problems I'm seeing in our money education today. I will talk about them. The first is the knowing-doing gap. We all know um, in financial education that it doesn't work when it comes to real behavioral action. It's kind of like going to the gym or eating healthy. I just know I have to do it, but I don't. We need to start moving our energy away from information dissemination to really lo start looking at behavioral change. The second problem is that we all learn about money in the context of the I. It's about individual survival, it's about individual comfort, and it's about individual success. What would money look like if we actually thought about how do you, how, what is our money actually supporting in the world today? This is the reason why we now prioritize, we are obsessed about personal profit over people and the planet. And what would it look like if we embrace the flow of money and what it is supporting. Even if you didn't care about people or the planet, I really want to talk about our own well-being and mental health because it is precisely in the countries that, and in the cities that we live in, Singapore, San Francisco, Hong Kong, London, that we are not seeing a correlation between an increase in wealth and mental well-being. In fact, these are the places where we are seeing increased anxiety, loneliness, anxiety. What would a money education look like if it was done in the context of our own well-being? So at Play Moolah, we have been looking at behavioral change for the past six years, and we thought, okay, if we want to 
you know, affect real financial empowerment, let's change behavior. You change your action, you change the result. What we realized after a couple of years was a missing piece, and this was the fundamental driver of behavior, and that was our relationship to money, our identity with money. And it's exactly the same thing in health. If I want to lose weight, I can go on all kinds of diets, I can take all kinds of pills, but what about my relationship to my body? What about my body composition? How much do we actually care about that? So it dawned on us that money needs a new narrative. And the problem why we have such an unhealthy notion of money in society is because money is riddled with so much judgment and shame and emotion. And it's such a hard topic to talk about beyond what's selling and what's on sale. So two years ago, a couple of us decided to do an experiment. We said, what if we open up our homes and invite our friends and our neighbors to come in and talk about money? This, the first circle started in San Francisco two years ago, in the middle right there, and it has rippled around the world. Um, this has become known as honesty circles, and people come in from all ages, from all walks of life, and talk about topics about money in a very deep and vulnerable way. We talk about things like, why does our self-worth depend on how much we earn? How much money is enough? What is security? And how much security can be found in money? Where do you find your security in? This has led to monthly inquiries of honesty circles around the world. And what we have seen is pretty transformational. Not only are we seeing our language around money start changing, but earning patterns and spending patterns are starting to change not because of external nudge, but because of an inner transformation. Going forward, we are hoping to train more facilitators to hold these circles all around the world, to do it in more schools, in more communities, and in workplaces. And following this, we know that you know, inner transformation is great, but it is action that determines our destiny. We have learned from our circles that it is in the tiny actions we take every single day that have the potential to rewire our brains and our own relationship with money. So what we have done is we are piloting this in the lab, a 21-day mindful money challenge and a whole series of challenges where you can take a small step every single day. It can come from a mobile phone, it can come in an email. We send you a suggested action for the day and you take it and you come back and reflect in a global community. What we're seeing is from very, very practical things like how much insurance is enough, like how do I automate my finances, to more transformational tracks like how do I consume consciously, how do I support a social enterprise that I see in my neighborhood, how do I give more, and how do I practice gratitude to move from scarcity to sufficiency. So all these might seem like very small acts. We have one small conversation, one small story, but we believe that by one small act at a time, we can transform the culture of money. Thank you.